Uh, hey guys, I'm Adam. I'm Christopher Medina. And this is how Generation X can protect themselves from cybercrime. First, I'd like to show you guys a video we made using the Adobe, Spoke so Adobe, Spark Adobe Spark software. Uh, this video will explain what we're going to present to you guys. Uh, first, I would like to show you an infographic that we ma that I made. Uh, on the on the on the blue side, you can read on how to protect yourself from a hacker, and on the orange side, you can see what to do when you have been hacked. And uh, there QR the QR codes, depending on which side you're reading on, it can lead you to the source of where how to protect yourself on what to do when you get hacked. Cybersecurity is an extremely important and safe society. 73% of all Americans are victims of cyber attacks. Uh, first, we have to explain uh, how we were prepared for this project. <coughs> first, uh, the home networking project in which we surveyed and made a proposal. Here is uh, an image of the example of the proposal that we made. I made it. I on the interviews, we interviewed people about their social uh, online, how, what to do, what, what they do, and what to do according to the according to their actions online. The infographics, as I've shown you before, are made from this, the information and, and investigation we have done. When technology advances, it has an increase in cyber attacks. As you can see in the graph, from 2001 to 2017, it increased by over a billion attacks. Uh, Generation X is very vulnerable to a cyber attack. As you can see here, uh, a table that shows how vulnerable or how likely they are to get hacked. Uh, a survey shows that mm, they are the most generation that gets really concerned about having their, their security online getting hacked. However, most don't do anything to better their, their security. Generation X will use the internet for their work purposes. Uh, to elaborate on this, they would use their emails to speak with coworkers and maybe family members. Um, Generation X is a common target because they usually are working. Um, some of the vulnerabilities are phishing emails 
as you can see here, there are some examples that people try to disguise themselves, like fake accounts, that some people try to disguise themselves as companies or co-workers of the person that they're attacking, so they can share information. The personal, the third one is the personal information, that that is the information you need to keep safe, because that can affect your, your life pretty heavily if you were to get out. Cyber attacks increase daily. 60% uh, of people from Generation X are affected by security breaches. Uh, the stronger, the strongest protection starts with yourself. Because you, you, you have to be the one who takes action to, to protect yourself. You need to have strong passwords. That is a must. You, you always, because when you have an easier password, because you may not remember it very well, you make it easier for the hacker to get into the account. And you need to be very aware of malicious emails and links because they are most likely viruses. You should secure information with a VPN. Uh, it will make a public network uh, secure. So say you go into Starbucks or McDonald's, use their free Wi-Fi. If you don't have a VPN, you are at a very high risk to be attacked. A VPN, you can download it on the App Store or online. It, you can buy an either free one or you can pay money for it. What it will do is just make everything secure and you won't get hacked. Uh, you need to keep your perf personal information really secure. You need to keep it private. Some, some, in some places that people don't, will not be able to get into it. And you, you never have to share sensitive information because that is who you are. And identity theft is a very, very personal and very um, a very common attack, as you can say it. You should learn how to protect yourself from an attack. Having your antivirus up to date is a very big step to protecting yourself. If your antivirus is not up to date, there can be vulnerabilities to the security. And you should just back up your data regularly. In case you are attacked, you can delete all that information and go to your backup information. Uh, you need to act quickly if you get hacked. Because you must change your password and all of the passwords it was linked on because sometimes when you have an email account, it can be linked to many other sites like Facebook, Twitter, and when that attacker has, the, has your email, they can, uh, they can basically hack your other accounts without any more action. You should just secure data. In case you are attacked, you can always just delete all your sensitive data so the attacker can't use it. And you should, make, you should monitor your bank systems just in case the attacker stole any of your money. And if, this, if you get attacked, you should alert the proper authorities, such as the police or any other sufficient uh, people to help you. Uh, you need to always remember, remember that you are the target. Just because you have just little information doesn't mean that the hacker won't target you. That the hacker can target anyone because that uh, attackers and criminals always find a way to get the most out of you and you should expect to get hacked because as technology keeps increasing as also the hackers keep increasing and you need to have a plan of what to do when you get hacked. Thank you for listening. Do you guys have any questions for us? No. Uh, Nord VPN is a good one. I personally use a Hotspot Shield VPN. Usually that will work for me. Any more? No, thank you. What is CART? CART is a UC-approved high school. That is collaborative. And real world. CART is hands-on. And career-focused. CART is technology. CART is project-based. CART is diverse. And a great way to meet new friends. 
CART is a professional environment. And a great way to plan for your future. I am CART. I am CART. Yo say CART. Go yeah CART. I am CART. Are you? Call, click, or speak with your counselor to find out how you can apply today. Yeah. I know, I'll spit on my real quick. <laughs> I know. <sighs> couple minutes, y'all, just a couple. Thank you for all being here today to witness the launch of our new social awareness campaign, Anti-Social Media. The purpose of this campaign is to bring awareness for a relatively new epidemic that's been gripping our society. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh, we want to bring awareness to a new epidemic that's been gripping our society over the past decade. Now, this epidemic has addictive properties that have been compared to methamphetamine, marijuana, cocaine, even heroin but you don't need to shoot it, pop it, snort it, or smoke it. You just need to tap it and scroll it. Now this epidemic, this disease, the most dangerous part of it is that it's made readily available to children of all ages and teenagers by their parents. And it fits right here in your pocket. Hi, my name is JJ Dirksen. I'm Chris Cantoriano. I'm Keanu Wallace. I'm Jesse Garza. And I'm Logan Lowe, and we are New View Media. So the main purpose of the hashtag anti-social media campaign is to answer the question of, does social media really make you more social? The obvious answer I'm sure you know is no. Social media creates antisocial people and antisocial properties in all of its users. In fact, those who use social media or technology at a young age can develop slow cognitive development, worse social skills, and a decreased ability to communicate. This is detrimental to their success further in life as it provides fewer opportunities for a stable career and a less smaller ability to have a stable relationship. With our slogan, Real Life Over Likes, we want to emphasize that people should start valuing the relationships they have in real life. 
We feel like it's an ongoing problem where people would rather pull out their phone, look through their Twitter and Instagram, rather than talking to the person sitting directly in front of them. After Facebook was introduced in 2004, in 2008 about 10% of the U.S. population used social media, and that greatly increased to 80% in 2017, and that's after um, Snapchat, Facebook, and Instagram, all those social media guys, sites that you guys use today came out. And to also include, and also in 2008, there was about 100 million Facebook users world, worldwide, and that skyrocketed up to 2.2 billion in 2018. Now the reason for the growth Chris mentioned in the last slide is that social media is making its way throughout the age demographic ladder. Social media use started by college students in Harvard in 2004 with the launch of Facebook. Since then it launched over to the older age demographic through to teenagers, the elderly, and even now to preteens and adolescents. As I said earlier, this is detrimental to the f uh, future success of these young kids. Similarly to how alcohol can permanently damage the brain of young adolescents when used under age, social media has similar characteristics. Like I said, it's going to slow their cognitive development. They're not going to be able to hold a good conversation. They're going to have worse social skills. And they're going to have just all around decreased ability to communicate. I'm sure you've seen that young kid who's buried in his phone and as soon as you go to talk to him, he can't hold a simple conversation with you. Paradigm is an organization that deals with teens and addictions. They are located in Malibu. If you cannot reach the location, you give them a confidential call and they'd be more than happy to help you. Comprehensive Youth Services is a local organization that we've interviewed. They have seen a recent rise of teenagers and their addiction to technology. Social media greatly impacts people from ages 3 to 18 years old and creates a false reality of other people's lives. That's when people start to compare themselves to like celebrities, people with fame, or people who are not. And that's when and social media also causes you to lack social skills, so that face-to-face -face interaction is going to a screen-to-screen -screen interaction. And it also causes you to have symptoms of insecurities or even depression. Our target audience is primarily teenagers. Because social media is relatively new, the younger audience are more likely to use it, especially excessively. One thing we found in our research is that teenage girls are more likely to abuse social media or become addicted. However, it's anybody who struggles with issues such as social anxiety, a lack of confidence, or they don't really get attention from the people around them. So they go to social media because they feel like it might be easier to meet people there. However, like Chris said, when you go on social media, you don't see people for who they truly are. You see a highlight reel of themselves and them living their best lives. So when you have people who are already having these issues, it can actually make them even worse. So the reason why teenage girls are so vulnerable to social media addiction is just a simple fact, they lack self-confidence. So since they lack self-confidence, um, when they're scrolling through their social medias, they see this beautiful girl with a beautiful house and all these things, and they just envy that, which causes them to feel a little down about themselves, which later can lead to depression. Um, since this is such an upcoming um, thing, there has been zero past campaigns, but we did find documentaries that basically inspired our whole project, which was Disconnected and Project Socialized. These two documentaries had real people that suffered um, real things from um, social media addiction. So like Jesse said, our main target market is gonna be teenagers. And because of that, we surveyed 100 students at the Center for Advanced Research and Technology to figure exactly why, what teenagers think about social media and how their brains tick when it comes to social media. As you can see here, we asked students how do they feel when they are unable to use their phone. Now a large percentage of teenagers feel no difference at all, or they may even feel relieved when they don't have their cell phone with them. However, there's still a good percentage that feel angry or frustrated or they may just feel annoyed about it, or they may even hear imaginary ringtones and vibrations when they don't have their phone. These are all key symptoms of withdrawal, and withdrawal is one of the key characteristics and symptoms of an addiction. Now you can see we also asked students how do they feel emotionally after using social media. Now there's two sides of the story here on this graph. You'll see that many students feel informed or entertained when they're scrolling through Instagram or Twitter. And this is because social media is, again, like a drug, like one of the drugs I mentioned earlier. It releases a dopamine fix in the pleasure center of the brain, and that's what keeps grabbing people in and pulling them into their feed. When they need, you know when you need to focus on a project or homework, but you keep going back to Instagram? It's because your brain craves that dopamine fix, similar to a meth addict who hasn't gotten a fix in a while. You'll see on the other side that many students feel distressed or depressed or sad or insecure when they're not using social media. This is because Oh, uh, this is also detrimental to the mental health of teenagers. Teenagers have a very fragile mental health, as Kiki mentioned earlier, and this amplifies the effects of that, those mental problems. This could be one of the key reasons for the recent rise in suicide rates among teenagers over the past decade. 
So with our strategy for this campaign, we wanted to use a lot of black and white to signify that theme of isolation and loneliness that happens when you're constantly on your phone as opposed to interacting with the people around you. You'll also notice that all of our pictures have teenagers because we want our market to be able to relate to the people in the pictures and see themselves in it and hopefully get that idea that social media does have these negative effects. And also with all the content that we're creating, it's going to go on our social medias because the best way for us to reach our target audience is on social media itself. In our billboard, um, as to what Jesse had said, we wanted to continue using that black and white theme to create a sense of loneliness and sadness. And as you can see in the middle right there, we have hashtag anti-social media. We wanted to have that there to spread the message through social media. And at the bottom of it, we have real life over likes so that we want to let you know that real life matters over likes. And at the top left corner, we have the comprehensive youth services. We have that there so we can have a source for our target audience to go to if they have this type of problem. Now you may be asking, um, since we bash on social media so much, why are we even using it? The main reason is because, like Jesse said, our main target market is teenagers, and this is where the attention of all teenagers are. Although we have a billboard, that's not where their attention is going to be most of the time. If they're in the passenger seat, they're scrolling through Instagram. So because of this, we put most of our focus on Instagram, social media, uh, Facebook, and Twitter. Um, as you can see, we kept consistent with that black, gray, and white theme to show that feeling of isolation uh, and also to have our audience recognize our posts whenever they see them. We, uh, you chose, we chose to use uh, short form captions with just one word, in this case addiction, because we know teenagers aren't there to read. They're there to be entertained and play with their emotions. So they're not there to read long form captions where we're just spitting statistics out them. So in this case, we just wanted to play with their emotions and serve as a constant reminder that, you know, hey, I've been on Facebook for a while, maybe I should just stop scrolling. We recycle the same content for Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, with the only exception being the couple, uh, couple tweets, which are the native content of Twitter, which feature no pictures and no video whatsoever. We also created a website which serves as the home base for all of our marketing efforts. So this is our home page, and as you scroll down, you will get some info and some side effects, what social media can do to you, and then a couple of our videos. And if you go to the facts and stats tab, you'll see some facts about social media and what else it can do to you and then the, um, our team page, which is a little bit about ourselves. In our storyboard for our video, we have a couple that is very happily together, but throughout the scenes, we begin to show how more and more distant the boyfriend is becoming due to the fact how he is using his phone and getting distracted with social media. And towards the end of the scene, we wanted to show the boyfriend by himself, not even realize that his girlfriend had left him. And at the end of the video, we would like to blacken the screen to uh, end with a message saying, real life matters over likes. So now we'll show our video. Please note the constant change in colors to show that feeling of isolation throughout the, throughout the scenes. So our goal with this campaign was to show people that it's all about balance. We want people to stop putting so much time and so much effort into their social media accounts because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter about how many likes you have, how many comments you have, or how many friends you have on social media. What really matters is all the life experiences you have and whether you spend them with the people you love, your friends, your family, and being able to truly connect with people. And in conclusion, we want to inspire everybody who's here today listening to our message. Everybody who sees our website, our social media, our billboard, our video, or hears us speak and hears our message. We want to inspire them to make a choice today, to inspire their friends, their loved ones, or their family to make the choice right now to choose real life over likes. Thank you.
at New View Media. Yeah, any questions? I'm McCormick. I'm Michelle Vega. I'm Harneet Sangera. I'm Jackson Drake. I'm Mia Romero. And I'm Kaylin Carver. As a, as a group, we chose the challenge of students struggling in schools. Uh, the project assigned required a website, which, uh, required a web, or which required the challenges the students face and how to help them. Lawyers work with us to improve our policy, and we found nonprofits to partner with. Uh, this is our group, Just Breathe. Uh, our topic for this project was teens struggling in school. 
uh, our group was started to help students get the support that they need. And we were and still are interested in this topic because we've either been through the situation our, ourselves or have seen our friends or classmates go through it. So we really wanted to change the definition of what it means to struggle in school. And there's an entire spectrum that people don't really recognize. So on one side of the spectrum, there are kids who have, have never had support by their parents, don't know how to ask help from their peers, and have always been, never been valued by their teachers and kind of made fun of. Yet on the other side of the spectrum, there are kids who are pushed into the highest classes, who have no support systems and have overbearing parents. So some students struggle with lack of support systems. They have no friends or families or uh, teachers to, to support them in their, in their challenges of struggling in school, whether it be anxiety or insecurity. So we need to give or provide a support system. And there are some students who have overbearing parents who are, put, or who are constantly pressuring their child to get straight A's, take AP or honors classes, and also do extracurricular activities. And this can cause the child to be constantly stressed. Um, Peace in Schools is a nonprofit organization that we used as a reference for our project for students struggling with anxiety. It basically is an organization that helps um, students develop self-awareness or emotional resilience. Therefore, they could just cope more with their um, current situations instead of having to deal with them through school situations or whatever family situations that they're going through they can deal with it without anxiety or learn how to cope with what they're going through one of the things that we were tasked with was creating a billboard that not only reflected our issue but it also provided an answer we wanted parents going to school dropping their kids off heading to work to see this and think okay well maybe my child struggles with anxiety but what can i do to help them that's why we partnered with the NAMI to help provide an answer. We wanted parents to see this and think, okay, I know what I can do for my child. NAMI is the National Alliance on Mental Illness. They're a very great organization that is nationwide and has a base here in Fresno. They have counseling groups and support systems for not only students who are struggling, but adults who are struggling in their everyday lives. They're a very great organization. We're very thankful to work with them. So another current policy that we focused on was Clovis Unified School District's CSI policy. This is a support group. It stands for Clovis Support and Intervention. You are referred into these groups based on challenges that your teachers or peers might notice. So it's an eight week session. Once a week you meet for one hour and you're grouped up with your peers that may be going through similar at home or personal challenges as you. There are multiple subtopics that you can be put into from divorce, grief and loss, anger management, and there's even just a general where you don't have to really relate to the person next to you, but you're able to confide in each other and talk about your issues with one another. Um, on the right, we actually have, they collect data at the end of every single eight week session. And on the right is a chart of attendance rates here at CART after doing the CSI groups, which shows that there was a 50% increase in attendance along with 25% that stayed unchanged. So along with the data that was collected for attendance rates, they also collected free response answers asking how you felt after joining this group. Some of the students here at CART said, this group changed my mindset and I started having fewer anxiety attacks. I could get emotional support at school and not suffer in silence. I learned to trust more and ways to cope with my struggles. So based on all of this, we want to bring CSI groups into Fresno Unified School District. There's a lot in Fresno Unified where you can always get help on your AP exams and studying for your tests, but there's nothing sociocultural. There's nothing to meet with your peers to be able to discuss what you're going on at home and why it may be affecting your grades or your motivation to do things. So in order to do this, this is our plan of action. So first, we need to get the support group's curriculum. This is actually copyrighted by a woman who created it, and she lives in Arizona. There are multiple booklets, like I said, of subtopics, so we need to pay for that curriculum to be used in Fresno Unified. Next, we want to approach an administrator for CSI, which we actually already did. Her name is Cheryl Curtsy. Her sole job for Clovis Unified is to coordinate CSI groups. She's also the one that provided the data for us. So we really want to have her by our side to partner with us so that we can recreate this exactly how we want it so that we know it'll be successful. After that, we have to request for the staff training. 
So obviously for these peer groups, you can't just leave class for one hour without any staff or teachers there and just have a group of kids for an hour. So we actually have to do staff training, which is a three-day training, um, but we need LCAP funding for that. LCAP funding is state funding that's given to the school districts where they plan it out before the year so they know how much money to put aside. So we need the money because it's a three-day training that provides lunch and all the booklets and curriculum to these uh, staff members um, so that they can run the groups themselves. After that, we want to advertise to students around schools. So first, we're actually going to pilot this at Bullard. So to advertise, we really want to put posters up um, along with brochures, maybe pamphlets to hand out, and our multimedia lab is actually creating the new CSI groups, so we would like to, or their posters, so we would like to partner with them to change them to FSI. So it would cost $7,100 in total. Now that sounds like a large number at first, but discussing it with the Bullard High School principal and several other officials, they explained how it's a very minimal cost and has a large amount of benefits. And then also a few hundred dollars would also be dedicated to creating posters at schools in order to gain publicity and get people interested. But that could also be solved by making announcements at, for, at school in the morning. Yet um, ideally, so a Fresno Unified absence costs about $270 for each school. So all in all, Fresno Unified has lost $51 million in absences and state funding. Therefore, because it's been proven by 50% increases in attendance, the idea is that people will suddenly feel motivated to come to school, to, have, to be able to ask questions and not be afraid because they have psychological help and friends from their peers. So I've been a member of the CSI groups for two years now. Um, I've been a Bullard High student for four years. Um, my freshman year, my mom got diagnosed with cancer one month into my year. Um, this created a lot of anxiety for me. It was very difficult to talk to my teachers and be able to say that I might need a little extra time on assignments because my mom was throwing up due to chemotherapy the whole night before. Um, it's a very difficult and life-changing experience. Um, but when my junior year came, I have been planning on coming to CART since I was in about fifth grade. And I toured the campus with my brother when he was in high school. So I had been planning on coming to this school for a very long time. Um, so when I applied, I got into the psychology lab. Psychology, their lab really emphasizes getting to know you personally and creating a bond with you. So at the very beginning of the year, we were required to write an essay about our lives. In this essay, I talked about my mom and how we already knew that we had a time going and that the time was running out. Um, immediately after the essays were being read, uh, Mrs. Thornton, one of the psychology teachers, came up to me and she asked if I would like to join the CSI grief and loss group. Um, I said yes, of course, and I actually had Mrs. Thornton and Mr. Carlo as my grief and loss like counselors, and I met with about six other peers once a week, and we were able to talk about what we were going through. In this group, I actually met a girl who had the same birthday as me and was going through the same situation as me, but with her dad. And so I finally had someone where I didn't feel so alone, and I knew that someone else was going through the same situation as me. Once again, Bullard, I was very open with people. A lot of people did know at Bullard. My mom was really involved in Fresno Unified School District, so they knew, but there was nowhere to send me. There was no help. It was just kind of like a, how are you doing? But you didn't really care about how I answered, and there was nowhere to send me to provide and get help. Um, then my senior year, this year, one week before senior year, my mom passed away. Um, Bullard knew, and they were aware about it, but. Once again, there was still nowhere for me to go, nowhere to confide in. And personally, the school psychologist, I was close to her. Um, she was my mom's friend, but she never sought me out. And there was nowhere for me to really go talk about my problems. But right when I got to CART, which was one week after, I was immediately, I had a letter from my psychology teachers. My current teachers already knew on the first day of school. And I was immediately put into another CSI group who I still meet with. Um, and it's been absolutely amazing. They're super beneficial and they release a lot of anxiety and I'm able to talk about what I'm going through. So for English, we were assigned with writing a poem that had to relate to the topic that we chose, which was students struggling in school. So I wrote a poem and related it to this topic. She sighed and thought of all the things she was missing out on, making lifelong memories, having smile lines, or sleeping early. All she could think of was the stress that derived from the amount of schoolwork, the long and stressful nights, all the joy she was missing out on, all the joy she perhaps could have at dawn. So in order to make the proposal of the CSI policy, we had to take certain actions in hopes of Fresno Unified implementing this policy. So the first thing we did was meet with Tina Chandler and Keith Williams, who lead the groups, the CSI groups here at CART. 
The second thing we did was meet with Cheryl Curtsy, the, the CSI head coordinator, and she gave us data and information that we needed. And the third thing we did was meet with Bullard High School's principal, and he was very excited about bringing the CSI groups to Fresno Unified. And the plans we, we, the plans we, we plan on taking after are making posters in hopes of students being more aware of these CSI groups and also raising awareness for parents as well so Fresno Unified can see that parents and students are also interested in these CSI groups. So I actually just went to an LCAP meeting about two nights ago and was able to learn about how to get my voice heard and how to get funding into Fresno Unified School District for this. And I met with Principal Castillo and he's extremely excited and I just asked him who in this room can I speak to that can take me to the next step? What am I supposed to do? And so I met the mental health social worker, Kane Christensen of Fresno Unified, and he's extremely excited to partner with us and pilot it at Bullard. Um, and we're actually all going to go speak at an all staff meeting next month on February 19th so that we can get the teachers on board with us. Um, and like I said earlier, I got in here on a chance. Like you all know, you're all CART students that we get in here based on a lottery. So I got help on a chance, and we really want to guarantee that all students and teens in school can be guaranteed a place to go to receive help. Do you have any questions? Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you.
You ready? Good morning. We are Studio 90 from the Multimedia Lab. I'm Soraya. I'm Hermione. I'm Jason. I'm Emma. I'm Rebecca. I'm Giovanni. And for our project, we had to create a documentary about an inspirational organization that helps to benefit our local community. So we chose to tackle the high school dropout epidemic. We chose the high school uh, dropout epidemic because it's such a glossed over issue in America. And we wish to bring it into a wider audience for people to see that this issue is very serious. We're highlighting the organization Learn for Life because of how it targets these issues. Learn for Life has schools spread across the country that really help students reach their full educational potential. And this issue is so important because not only does it affect the individuals, but the community as a whole, meaning the entire nation. Each one of us also conducted an individual six-page research paper, which we later on combined into one big 12-page research paper in the courses of three to four weeks. With the um, once we um, merged our research papers, we used it as a guide for our documentary and our infographs that you will see later. Uh, we believe video is powerful when portraying a message and trying to spread a movement uh, against the high school dropout epidemic that maybe a research paper or an academic journal couldn't do. Something about seeing the visuals right in front of you, seeing a face that's connected to the issue, really impacts the viewers. Um, so without further ado, here's Studio 90's Dropout. Change the story. High school, the best years of our life, right? For some, this isn't further from the truth. For one reason or another, students across the nation are dropping out in crippling numbers. For many, a typical high school environment feels painfully repetitive and unfit to be in. Factors beyond a student's control is many times a core reason for a student's dropout. The issue affects everyone in the community and even America. But there's a vicious cycle in play that sometimes feels hopeless. But it's not hopeless. Good people across the nation are doing their part to end this epidemic. So why are high schoolers of today dropping out? With the high school dropout rate at such high numbers, knowing the causes could help improve that statistic. Um, the dropout rate is affected by a multitude of things. Um, we have students who drop out because of work. We have students who drop out because of children. We have students who drop out for many reasons that may not be affected directly by school. High school students are very complex and live through real life issues that cause teens to make very difficult decisions at a young age. Teenagers have a lot of pressure on them regarding school, family, and society. These factors within said students' lives pull them away from graduating in a typical high school environment. The effects of high school dropouts not only affect the student, but the community, and in a way, the world. In their lifetime, a dropout will cost the taxpayer on average $292,000. This is from how much less income they make on average and potential incarceration costs. According to a statistic by Matthew Lynch, if all the dropouts from the class of 2011 had earned diplomas, the nation would benefit from an estimated $154 billion in income over their working lifetimes. Not only do dropouts statistically make far less money than graduates, they are often unemployed and lack the resources to pursue further education. Statistics like these truly show that it's everyone's problem. So what's the solution? Though the end of high school dropout epidemic may never come, the hardworking people at Learn for Life and branching school Crescent View West have made promising strides towards helping those in need of help. Uh, Crescent View West gives students um, an opportunity to do schoolwork on their own time and their own schedule, which allows them to not be um, confined to, say, an 8 to 3 traditional Monday through Friday schedule. Students feel like they fall through the cracks in big classrooms. And one thing that we do here at Crescent View is we communicate a lot. You don't fall through the cracks here. Um, and we have students who say, I've never felt like I've been cared about so much at school. Students who aren't doing well and aren't a problem will be neglected or allowed to slip away. I would say Learn for Life is a bit 
better than or from like public school just because you you grow and it goes at your own pace so it's up to you to like push yourself to finish the credits and to do everything on time. Some come from, you know, abusive households or even, you know, who are homeless. And the thing that we do is we, we still provide for them. We have food, snacks, but we also provide these backpacks with, you know, sleeping bags. We provide sleeping bags, clothes, anything that our students need. Learn for Life provides unique educational opportunities to those who are unable to learn at conventional public schools. These students gain the opportunity to be successful later on in life. If more programs like this existed, many people could better their lives and even the public as a whole could improve. The high school dropout epidemic is silent. Its causes can't be tracked down to any one single factor. When a student is struggling or dropping out, it makes waves. With effects reaching across the country affecting everyone, schools like Crescent View West and the Learn for Life program show that hope is not lost for those that are at risk to fail. So what can we do as a community to support those in need? The high school dropout epidemic, though daunting, is not a lost cause because it's important to remember it's truly everyone's problem. All right, so that was our documentary uh, made after nine to 10 weeks of filming, editing, scripting, uh, interviews, research, etc. So as seen in the video, there are many factors that can discourage one from attending high school. And one of these factors is teen pregnancy. Research shows that 70% of the girls who get pregnant drop out of high school. And with these causes, there's an average of 1.2 million dropouts every year. Uh, and as we saw in the video, uh, a dropout on average will cost the taxpayers $292,000. And multiplied by how many dropouts in America there are, uh, that number is in the hundred billions. Learn for Life targets these issues by offering a unique, flexible schedule for the students that take part in it. The students only have to go to school two days a week, and that really helps them balance their lives between home and school. Learn for Life also provides for its um, for its students, providing them with food, um, clothes, any hygiene products they need. And we spent around six weeks of post-production after doing our research, which included six interviews, two hours of B-roll, and many hours of editing during and after school. And the documentary was a manifestation of our information as a result. Uh, we decided to have a representative actor in the intro, as you saw just to really showcase that dropouts are people too. They're just people just like you and me, and we should support them in these issues. We really wanted to grab that empathy from our audience. Uh, one thing that's so cool about the documentary format is how shareable it is. For example, our video was actually posted on the Learn for Life Facebook page, which has thousands of followers, and it got hundreds of views that we would not have gotten traction others otherwise. So it's definitely making a positive change in our community. We each also make infographs, and these infographs are to convey the most important parts of a topic. We made our infograph from scratch, which took us about two and a half months to make. And my infograph, or my, the goal of my infograph, is to communicate using imagery through big fonts and big numbers. And if you think about it, the dropout rates affect about 20% of the U.S. population. You might think that's only a small portion, but that affects about 80% of a state's population in some way or somehow. So students are subject to situations outside of their control, not only at school, but also at home. Using colors that pop out from the background, my infograph shows that 32% of students drop out for what some may see as a minor reason, like not keeping up with schoolwork. For my infograph, I wanted to keep the infographics separate from the background so that they would stand out more. The infographics cover how Learn for Life allows students to go at their own pace. They use one-on-one -on -one learning so that teachers can give each student their full attention. Learn for Life also comes at no cost to the students, which is extremely beneficial to those who are financially struggling. So there are many things that can impede one from reaching their full educational potential. 
and these things can't always be seen coming or prepared for. There are many causes as to why a student would drop out, and it not only affects the student, but it affects the community as well. All right, so in conclusion, the dropout epidemic is huge. It, it covers uh, our entire nation, and it's, it's very daunting. But Learn for Life is making progress to what is everyone's problem. Thank you. Any questions? What is CART? CART is a UC-approved high school. That is collaborative and real world. CART is hands-on and career-focused. CART is technology. CART is project-based. CART is diverse. And a great way to meet new friends. CART is a professional environment. And a great way to plan for your future. I am CART. I am CART. Yo soy CART. Go yeah, CART. I am CART. Are you? Call, click, or speak with your counselor to find out how you can apply today. I'm Tyson Bowen. I am Blake Smith. And I'm Anaisa Vidakis. And today we will uh, reveal a treatment that will revolutionize the medical world as we know it. First, a disease of pure hardship. A disease in 2018 alone was estimated to infect 1.7 million people and kill 609,000 of those people. A disease that needs a better treatment, cancer. Cancer is the uncontrollable growth of abnormal cells in the body. An example of these abnormal cells are cells that have been infected with the human papilloma virus. This virus is spread through skin-to-skin -skin contact and can cause lumps or warts on the body. So when going in for a checkup, doctors will notice this change of skin, although sometimes, given time, the change of skin will go away and you'll be fine. Although unfortunately, in most cases, this virus will cause cancer. Now you may be wondering, how are these cancer cells able to grow so rapidly? That is because cancer actually begins as our body's control mechanism fails meaning we are not able to control the amount of cells being grown inside our body. So the old cells that usually die off continue to rapidly grow, creating new abnormal cells. And as these new abnormal cells, abnormal cells grow, they cause clumps of cells known as tumors. Now, if you're anything like me, you tend to question just about everything. And a question that I had as soon as this topic came up was what is the danger or why are these cancer cells or tumor cells such an issue? Well, this is because when these tumor cells or cancer cells form in the body, they create a mass. And this mass does not allow the body to function normally. Or, in other cases, patients can result in death. 
Currently, there are several cancer treatments available to the public. Some of these include chemotherapy, gene therapy, several types of surgeries, and drug treatments. However, none of these treatments can compare to photodynamic therapy. The reason being they are more expensive and they have miserable side effects. Some of these side effects can include nausea, vomiting, fatigue, hair loss, and numbness, and even loss of sensation if the surrounding nerves are damaged. These treatments leave patients feeling miserable and, leave, and living horrible lives. Now scientists were able to change that. Now we have a treatment that is little to no side effects. Photodynamic therapy. This is surprisingly a treatment that has been around for thousands and thousands of years. Scientists have been using uh, UV light or sunlight to correct or help heal different illnesses. Not, not very long ago, as of 1990, scientists were able to perfect and modernize this treatment. This is when scientists came up with a photosynthesizing drug in addition to a simple three-step process that allows everything to work. First, the drug, the photosynthesizing drug, must be administered or applied to the patient. Once the drug has been applied, uh, the patient will then have to go through a distribution period or an incubation time. This basically gives the patient time to let the drug run throughout their entire body, get in their bloodstream and spread. Once the incubation period has been completed, scientists then come to the destroying process. This is when the actual cancer cells are destroyed. The first step is to apply the photosensitizing drug to the patient. Now this can be done primarily via needle. However, depending on the patient's preference, it can be administered by a cream or an oral tablet. Now this drug contains chlorophyll, which can be extracted from plants and bacteria. The scientists use this chlorophyll because it creates its own oxygen and also because it allows the reaction to occur between the light and the photosensitizing drug. Once the drug is applied to the body, it takes them anywhere from 24 to 72 hours in order for the drug to completely spread throughout. Now, it is very important that for the first 24 hours of the incubation process, the, dark, the patient stays within a dark room. That is why it is advised by doctors before leaving the house to shut the blinds and close all the windows so that you will not be reacted to the light. Because yes, this drug does go through all cells, healthy and cancerous. And if they're being very reactive to light, if a patient were to grow out too early, it could cause severe burns. Now, as of now, there's actually no scientific explanation of why this drug is able to highly concentrate within the cancer cells. But using the knowledge that we do know is that cancerous cells need a lot more nutrients to rapidly grow at the rate they do. So when the drug is entered into the body, cancer cells will quickly absorb and consume this drug, leaving small amounts for the healthy cells. As you see in this diagram here, healthy cells have slim to none of this drug inside of it, while the cancerous cells have a high amount. So yes, when the reaction does happen, a few healthy cells will be killed off, but given time, they'll come back uh, as, their normal, as their normal cells, while the cancerous cells will be killed. Now for the most exciting part of everything, this is when the cancer cells are actually destroyed out of the body. And above we have two simple diagrams to just explain this process for you. First, on the right side, we're able to visualize a very simple, simple step, three-step process. First, the drug is applied into the patient. Then, the patient is exposed to the UV light. This creates a reaction that destroys and kills off the cancer cells. Now, on the left diagram, we're able to see the exact same process, but just a little bit more complex. So when the light is shown into the infected area, where the drug has been absorbed, it creates that reaction. That reaction releases something called radicals. And these radicals, or ROS species, reactive oxygen species, are highly reactive and very unstable. This basically means that they want to become stable. So in order to do this, they go throughout the cell or anywhere that they can find to become stable. They want to attach themselves to something. Now in this destroying process, these unstable radicals go and they attach themselves to different parts inside of the infected cell. When this happens, it causes the cell to fail in normal functions. And once the cell has uh, begun to fail in various functions, it does something called apoptosis or self-destruction because now the cell is beyond all repair. 
And this entire process is only possible from the particular type of UV light that is used. As we can see on the left side of the diagram, there is a very weak kind of UV light. This light, is, this light is used to treat skin cancers that may be just on the bare surface of the skin. As we proceed to the right side of the diagram, we're able to visualize a very, very strong type of UV light. This is used to treat cancers that may have traveled to deeper depths of the skin. We have created a model to simplify the destroying process. So the box represents the patient's skin at a microscopic level. Inside the box, there are red spheres. These spheres represent normal, healthy human body cells. Towards the back of the box, there are discolored spheres, which represent tumors or cancerous cells in the body. Now, on the picture on the right, the discolored spheres are glowing. This shows that the laser has been shown onto the, in, sorry, onto the cancerous cells and that the reaction is taking place. So once we turn off the UV light, that is supposed to represent that the cancerous cells are beginning to die off. As of now, there are a few limitations to our treatment. Cancer that is without the blood, as leukemia, or cancer that is too deep within the body, photodynamic therapy cannot cure yet. Although, if the light is able to reach anywhere of the infected area, it can cure it. That is due to the fact that, as of now, there are only a few photosensitizing drugs approved by the FDA. So as research goes on, and as more of these photosensitizing drugs continue to be approved, photodynamic therapy will be the cure of most cancers. Our treatment for cancer has its limitations, yes. However, scientists and medical professionals continue to work every day of every moment to perfect these limitations. Once these limitations are perfected, scientists will continue to expand the abilities of photodynamic therapy. This is when patients will have absolutely zero side effects, and we will finally be able to cure different kinds of cancer. Photodynamic therapy will continue to revolutionize the medical world as we know it. Photodynamic therapy is our future. Thank you. Is there any questions? Yes. Yeah, so currently to treat different kinds of cancer, there's a large amount of treat, uh, many different kinds of treatments. As you can see on the slide, on our treatment slide, we're able to visualize just some of the very common cancer treating processes. Uh, photodynamic therapy is continuing to grow as it becomes uh, more, uh, has more pu publicity. However, these treatments have been used, but they cannot guarantee success for any of their uh, cancers that they are treating. Is there any more questions? Yes. <laughs> Biotechnology. Thank you. Oh. Your model. Very nice. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Are there any side effects to having the UV light exposed to the skin? Yes, there are very few side effects, but the only one is that the patient will be uh, affected to light for primarily like maybe a week or two. But rather than that, that is about all the side effects that you'll receive from this. And the reason that is so exciting and such a large step forward in science is because chemotherapy and all these other uh, different processes and different treatments, they cause patients to be absolutely miserable. They're basically suffering through these processes. And now scientists are able to offer something that may just affect for a couple of weeks uh, and maybe some sensitivity compared to lots of vomiting and lots of pain with other treatments. Yes? Is this a guaranteed success, like it will work or cure? Yes, in skin cancer, uh, which is its main purpose, it will completely kill all cancer cells, and yeah, this can completely work, 100%. The only time that it cannot kill uh, all of these cells is if they are not on the skin. So this treatment is designed specifically for skin cancer. Actually, yes. Um, lots of dermatologists uh, use photodynamic therapy for different kinds of treatments. Uh, this treatment of photodynamic therapy is used for more than just cancer. 
Dermatologists typically use it for uh, acne treatments and things like that. Is there any more questions? All right. Oh, right there. Yeah, so kind of going back to what you said before, what would it like the negative side effect of when they're exposed to light after your treatment therapy? So pretty much, yes. Yeah. So after the UV light is shown, uh, they are very reactive to light. And so that's why, like the doctors say, when you go home, just shut off like all your lights, keep the curtains closed and everything. That way you're fine. But yeah, if you go outside too early, unfortunately, sometimes you can receive burns, so it's uh, informed that you stay out of light after receiving this treatment for the first little while. Yeah. All right, thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Biomedicine. Students explore issues in medical science and human anatomy and physiology through their involvement in dissections, medical case studies, and research projects. Students investigate how a healthy body functions and how it reacts to disease. Students will collaborate with medical professionals at various hospitals and clinics in the Fresno Clovis area as they research a variety of medical topics. Biotechnology an exploding science field that leads to high paying jobs in medicine, biology, chemistry, agriculture, and environmental science. Students will apply DNA technology to genetically engineer bacteria, solve medical mysteries, clone tissues, diagnose genetic disease, and explore drug development and testing. Students will wrestle with difficult ethical issues that arise as a result of using biotechnology to solve problems. Business and Finance. Learn to manage and invest money. Learn to be your own boss in a business you create. Students study human behaviors of producing, distributing, and consuming materials, goods, and services in a world of limited resources. They learn how the financial services industry works as they strengthen the analytical, technical, and communication skills needed to succeed in any economy. Cybersecurity. Students learn to design, build, secure, and analyze computers and the networks that connect them. Through hands-on projects, they investigate the Internet of Things and how it is. And we are from the Psychology Lab, and today we'll be introducing to you our illusion, the phantom light bulb. So basically what it is, here is a concave mirror that we use, and this is probably the most important part of our illusion, only because it gives us the reflection that we are looking for. Over here is our, our exact object, and this is placed right in front of the concave mirror. Here is a socket that we use to help generate our light, and all together it creates a holographic of this image here. But the idea is that if you stand a certain distance from it, you are able to see the reflection right in front of you, which is similar to this here. But as soon as you try to grab it, which is what this person's doing, um, it's literally not there. So. Okay, so before understanding the physics behind our project, it is important to understand how a concave mirror works because the concave mirror is an essential tool that helps create our illusion. So how does a concave mirror work? A concave mirror has a reflecting surface that is curved inwards. This trait allows an object that is placed in front of the mirror to reflect opposite of its position. Now the size of the image that is projected onto the mirror depends on the focal length between the object and the mirror. For example, in this image here, the hand appears to be bigger than its actual size. And that is because the hand is really close to the mirror. And in order for our illusion to function properly, our object has to be placed on the center of curvature. And the center of curvature, as shown in this figure here, is the point at which the mirror curves. All right, so now that we have the information that we need to have in order 
I'm sorry, excuse me. In order for this to work, in or sorry, um, thank you. Uh, now that we have the context of a concave mirror here, um, we can put this together in our illusion to understand how this all works as a whole. So what happens uh, when we're looking at this illusion here? So when we're looking at this illusion, the light bulb on the bottom of the box here, it emits a light ray from one point on the bulb and it hits the mirror right here and it goes up to converge at one point in space in order to create this image of the light bulb on the box here. So now when we're looking at this, the light hits our eye, it goes through the lens right here and it focuses the light, the lens focuses the light so that an image can be formed on the retina right here. And this allows us to see the light on top of the box right here. And even though it looks like there is a light on top of the box, it is in reality just a uh, picture or an image on the mirror. Uh, all right, so now that we have this visual information, we can go in depth about how vision works. So it's important to understand that all humans have this thing called binocular vision. And this is the crossing in the right and left visual fields. This allows us to have depth perception and it allows us to understand where objects are uh, in space from us, in relation to us. And uh, we have a part in our brain and our eyes called the lateral geniculate nucleus, or the LGN. And this is on the left and the right side of the eye, uh, eyes. It has uh, six layers, three layers for each side of the eye. And the left side of the eye processes the right field of vision, and the right side of the eye processes the left field of vision. Now, the information from the eyes go and it crosses through the optic chiasm right here so that it can go to its respective part in the brain and it goes all the way and travels back into the occipital lobe right here. Okay, so continuing on to what was said about the LGN, what you need to know is that there are two parallel channels that run through the LGN and they're known as the parvocellular layer and the magnocellular layer. So the parvocellular layer is responsible for responding to color, detail, and stationary objects and it runs through the top four layers of the, uh, the LGN. Meanwhile, the magnocellular layer responds to movement and runs through the bottom two layers of the LGN. Knowing what each one responds to, we know that the, mag the parvocellular layer will respond to the color and detail of the, uh, on the object, and the magnocellular layer will respond to where it's located at. So how do we process this illusion through the brain? So there are two streams in our brains that help process this illusion, and they are called the dorsal stream and the ventral stream. And the dorsal stream recognizes where the object is located at in space. And it runs from the dorsal, the occipital lobe into the parietal lobe. And on the other hand, the ventral stream identifies what we are seeing. And the information goes from the occipital lobe into the parietal lobe, the temporal lobe. And with that being said, the dorsal stream will recognize where the object is located at. And the ventral stream will help us identify the object that we're seeing. And that will be the light bulb. And with that, we have our illusion, the phantom light bulb. With that being said, if there's any questions, we would gladly like to answer them. Any questions? No? no? Okay, well, thank you. <laughs> Hold your microphone higher so that way you can help me. Learn to manage and invest money. Learn to be your own boss in a business you create. Students study human behaviors of producing, distributing, and consuming materials, goods, and services in a world of limited resources. 
they learn how the financial services industry works as they strengthen the analytical, technical, and communication skills needed to succeed in any economy. Cybersecurity. Students learn to design, build, secure, and analyze computers and the networks that connect them. Through hands-on projects, they investigate the Internet of Things and how it is changing the way we support current technology. The Cybersecurity Lab prepares students for the CompTIA a certification exam and qualified students may earn college credit through a dual enrollment program with Fresno City College. Engineering, Manufacturing, and Robotics. Creativity, knowledge, and skill are used to develop solutions to real-world mechanical engineering problems. Working as individuals and in small teams, students design, test, and evaluate working prototypes of their solutions. Students will learn how to bring engineering designs into the physical world using a variety of engineering tools, skills, and practices, including cutting-edge Before I came to CART, I was just some skater kid that didn't know how to talk to people. Here it, it made me professional. I know how to talk to people. I, at the year two, I was talking with clients. Um, so I really learned a lot. Looking at things from different angles and not being afraid to ask questions. That theory is okay. It's good to know um, a foundation of understanding. But then, how do we apply that understanding? And I think that's really left out a lot in traditional curriculum. You learn things, you memorize things, and then you regurgitate them for an exam. Whereas here at CART, you might learn a concept, but then all of a sudden, you have three teachers asking you the same concept in different ways. And then you have to be able to apply it in different scenarios. And that's much more real world. That's what I deal with every day. How to communicate with others in a professional manner, how to, how to act in a professional environment, how to dress, how to present yourself, prepare a resume, write a resume, conduct an interview, all those things um, were really valuable. In the second year program with biochemistry and OCHEM, you don't get that in a normal high school. And you're expected to go into college first year knowing what this stuff. So it, you got to expose um, to a lot of stuff that other high schools don't offer. I'm studying hard and uh, I'm taking work seriously and, and treating every day like an interview. Um, several professional people came in here and um, had potential to be my mentor or a future employer and so they just uh, instilled that um, you need to act professional and, and uh, treat everyone like they could be your future boss. What I really loved about CART was that the different type of environment it was, it wasn't kind of like an overwhelming environment. It was more of a relaxed, but like a fun environment. It was, I actually enjoyed coming to school here. I enjoyed every single day. I, I like to wake up and come to CAR. In my experience here, um, and then moving on to Fresno State, I, you know, I got less and less feedback from professors. I got, you know, A's and B's on my papers, whereas everybody else kind of struggled with the new college structure and the expectations of how do you write a report and how do you explain this and what do you mean research a topic? Um, and so all of those, all of those skills I learned here and it was, it came easier for me. Being able to stand up in front of the classroom and talk in front of hundreds of people. Uh, especially in the first year and second year program, we did showcase. Um, we were able to pick a disease, uh, do a poster on it, do research papers on it, and be able to educate the public. Uh, being able to talk to people, especially MDs that would come in that already know the material, and being able to prove to them that you understand what you're learning. At CART, my grades never changed. Whether I went to Bullard, whether I went to CART, um, I pretty much pulled a 3.7 all my years. What it really helped me do was apply what I learned. And I think from CART I learned that it was more important to understand the concepts and ideas over just the grade. CART helped me prepare for my current career by 
teaching me the software and the technical skills I needed, but also teaching me how to network, uh, work with the group, promote myself as well as my product with my group. I feel like without CART, I probably wouldn't be able to present myself as well. I may have learned on my own in my dark room how to edit uh, and use cameras and whatnot, but I might not have learned the people skills and how to present a final project like I learned here. Um, I knew how to present myself in front of a class. I knew how to dress, for, you know, I knew that you need to dress professionally. Um, I knew what it took to research a topic, properly cite it, read the material, and then come up with your own, um, own idea of what you read and how it relates to the topic and put that on paper. Those are all things I learned here. I, before I had come to CART, I had never, I, I didn't know how to write a resume. I didn't, I didn't know, I didn't have one. I didn't know what to put on it. I didn't know what it was supposed to look like. I'd never even seen one before. So CART helped me a lot. It helped me actually learn how to write a resume. And then from, with that resume, I was able to write, a, to get a job and then get work experience, get money to help pay for college and all this. I wouldn't have even gone to Fresno State the year I did. If it wasn't for CART, um, my friend Ben, he, he told me about CART and uh, I don't think he had a friend here and uh, I wasn't, didn't know about CART, didn't know what it was and so uh, I ended up coming to the business and finance class, I joined him. When you do it at the other schools, when you're talking to people that really don't care about the subject, um, when you talk to people that all care about the subject, your confidence kind of rises because you're not just saying things that no one cares about. Um, when you're actually talking to people, your peers, the ones that actually care, um, it really boosts your confidence and makes it easier to speak in public places. To learn on a greater, greater level, the MD that I shadowed actually let me listen to long sounds and let me observe certain procedures. And you're literally their shadow, so you're in every single room um, that they're in. And so you see a lot and you're exposed to a lot. Time management is definitely a big one. Um, working on my research project throughout the semesters um, allowed me to not only organize the time I was going to spend on certain parts and structures of that report, but it was also something that I took back in college and I utilized daily and I'm utilizing now in my job. I got the Weber scholarship, which I didn't think I would get. So I went from not knowing how to, I guess, turn on a computer to being able to go to Fresno State. Believe it or not, I was on the rather bottom tier of the academic scale. However, I had a lot of things that they didn't have. I had work experience um, through the United States Forest Service. I had an actual resume that I could present to them. I had volunteer experience. I knew how to network, which was a really important thing. I essentially had developed a library of people through CART that I met and worked with through my time here, and that helped me a lot. What I know out of the skills that I learned from being here at CART was presentation skills and professionalism and how to create PowerPoints and um, how, to, how to ask and figure out who your target audience is so you can be prepared for your presentation. So that's something that we were able to learn and practice here at CART um, in probably almost all of our projects we were expected to create PowerPoints and present to the class. So not only did you um, get the experience and exposure to being in front of an audience um, and, and that exposure and experience to being asked questions on the spot and how to respond. Um, so not only did you learn that, but you, were, you, were, you had to practice that. And with practice, you get more comfortable um, and you look more professional and experienced. I did an actual communications class just to see how great I was because I love public communications after going to CART. And like he actually made me not teach the class, but he actually made me be the example of what a great presentation would be. I, I know there are rumors that CART English isn't that great, but even as a person that isn't a huge English guy, my grandmother was an English teacher for 25 years, so I kind of grew up being hassled. Um, I, I don't enjoy reading, it puts me to sleep every time, but the material that was presented here always held my interest. Um, whether I really wanted to read the book or not, I always did, because I felt like it was designed to really help me and push me. So reading those upper level books and doing projects like we did here with groups really helped me to be able to collaborate in college and to push myself. Professionally, CART prepared me in a way that I never thought possible. And it wasn't something that I started off looking to do. 
It just happened. Uh, the biggest deal for me was learning how to deal with professionals. At CART, I did, I think, between three and four internships with different professionals in different areas. Kind of um, realized this is what I wanted to do instead of having to do all my studying, get there, and then realize I need to choose something else as a career path. Here, it's, it's interactive, you're with groups, you read it, you talk about it, you write about it, then you have your friends read it. Um, it's a lot more hands-on and it, it's a lot more effective for learning. CART, it taught you the actual um, nitty-gritty of everything, how to write, actually write a resume, conduct um, interviews, shake hands with people. CART taught you how to manage your classes. They taught you how to do that time management to where you could say, I want to do 30 minutes of this, I want to do 30 minutes of this, and then I'm going to go straight to my AP classes. You make what you want of it. They taught me how to be professional. I think that was one of the most important things and how to be a good public speaker. And um, on top of that, just um, countless computer programs that um, folks in my 300 level college courses did not know how to do. When I went into my first tech class in college, while they go ask, everyone make sure your mics work. So you, okay, no one's gonna say Test. Test. Owen Rivera. I'm Jai Vu. I'm Maria Torres. I'm Tyler Brown. I'm Jeremy Dahlberg. And I'm Samuel Christofferson. And we'd like to talk to you about VR, or virtual reality. Now, uh, VR is very popular in the gaming community, but uh, if it wants to survive as a standalone industry, it's going to need to expand into new markets and new areas, uh, as Tyler will tell you. Now, to understand that, we need to look at a company called NVIDIA. Now, NVIDIA is one of the leading manufacturers for graphics cards, a very important and expensive piece of hardware for computers. Therefore, it's generally only bought by gamers and computer builders. However, when Bitcoin recently gained popularity, suddenly everyone was using graphics cards to mine cryptocurrency. And at that point, NVIDIA's stocks rose. And they claimed to their investors that if cryptocurrency were to ever crash, then their, then their stocks would be just fine because gamers and computer builders would continue to buy their graphics cards. However, this is wrong. As we see here a year ago when cryptocurrency crashed, NVIDIA's stocks started to plateau and in these past three months have even dropped $130 per share. The takeaway here is this. Gamers cannot sustain an industry. This is why Lenovo has taken steps to make virtual reality a lot more accessible to the masses, because the more people who have the technology, the better it can be. Um, so Lenovo's new VR headset is this pictured right here. This is the Lenovo Mirage. Um, it is a standalone um, VR headset, uh, meaning it doesn't have any external wires or external hardware, so you don't need a uh, computer a, cons a video game console or a phone to, f to use it. <clears throat> the cameras on the front of the headset um, allow for a, a piece of software called WorldSense. And what WorldSense does is it allows the player to remain aware of what's around them while they're using the headset. <clears throat> the two displays located on the, or on, the, on the main part of the headset um, are of really high quality and they are very nice on your eyes so you can use them even after your eyes don't get irritated even after long-term use. The simplicity of the controller and of the Google um, Daydream software that is bundled with the headset, um, um, its simplicity allows anyone to pick up, the, pick up and use the headset in a matter of minutes. All, 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 all of these features combined um, make this headset very approachable. And um, it's very apparent why this headset is very ripe for the picking for many new industries. So to expand the market, we created educational games. 
This game, the building block game, is, is intended for younger children, typically around grade kindergarten to third graders. In the game, the player chooses whatever building block they want and move them around as they please. So the game is supposed to help children give an understanding of 3D space by using building blocks in a virtual environment. The benefits of building blocks is that it helps children develop hand-eye coordination, cognitive flexibility, and encourage them to be creative. Another example of how VR can help improve education is through the online education system. Um, men, in the world of today, many students gain their high school education through online education. And uh, the major downfall of this is the lack of a, social, or of a classroom setting. And what a classroom setting provides is social immersion and uh, easy communication between student and teacher. And without these components, uh, education is hindered for many. And so uh, what we did, we created an application that places a student in a virtual classroom where they're surrounded by other students also in that classroom. And all those students are taught by a teacher also in that classroom. Um, and so uh, we've programmed the student to be able to do pretty much anything they can do in a real classroom, such as raise their hand, um, ask questions, uh, create and edit documents, um, view approved media, um, even talk to other students. Um, and so this allows students to uh, get more of the social immersion aspect of a classroom setting as well as communicate with their teacher better than they would in a typical online education system. Um, and for the teacher, of course, because um, you know, a teacher is necessary for a classroom setting, uh, we've programmed it to allow them to uh, you know, call on students to um, assign curriculum to mute students if they're being a distraction, to move students around, um, and things of that ilk, pretty much anything that a teacher can do in a real classroom. Um, and so the purpose of this application is to not only improve the online education system, but also improve the, the breadth of uh, what VR is capable of doing. In addition to this, right now in VR, you can learn tangible skills that are valuable in the workforce right now. In VR, you can experience high stress situations in a simulated environment where you can train under pressure at no risk to yourself. Uh, that's our entire presentation, and we'd like to thank you for your time and take any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. What is CART? CART is a UC approved high school. That is collaborative and real world. CART is hands on and career focused. CART is technology. CART is project based. CART is diverse and a great way to meet new friends. CART is a professional environment and a great way to plan for your future. I am CART. I am CART. Yo say CART. Go yell CART. I am CART. Are you? Call, click, or speak with your counselor to find out how you can apply today. Biomedicine. Students explore issues in medical science and human anatomy and physiology through their involvement in dissections, medical case studies, and research projects. Students investigate how a healthy body functions and how it reacts to disease. Students will collaborate with medical professionals at various hospitals and clinics in the Fresno Clovis area as they research a variety of medical topics. Biotechnology an exploding science field that leads to high-paying jobs in medicine, biology, chemistry, agriculture, and environmental science. Students will apply DNA technology to genetically engineer bacteria, solve medical mysteries, clone tissues, diagnose genetic disease, and explore drug development and testing. Students will wrestle with difficult ethical issues that arise as a result of using biotechnology to solve problems. Business and Finance. 
Learn to manage and invest money. Learn to be your own boss in a business you create. Students study human behaviors of producing, distributing, and consuming materials, goods, and services in a world of limited resources. They learn how the financial services industry works as they strengthen the analytical, technical, and communication skills needed to succeed in any economy. Cybersecurity. Students learn to design, build, secure, and analyze computers and the networks that connect them. Through hands-on projects, they investigate the Internet of Things and how it is changing the way we support current technology. The Cybersecurity Lab prepares students for the CompTIA a certification exam and qualified students may earn college credit through a dual enrollment program with Fresno City College. Engineering, Manufacturing, and Robotics. Creativity, knowledge, and skill are used to develop solutions to real-world mechanical engineering problems. Working as individuals and in small teams, students design, test, and evaluate working prototypes of their solutions. Students will learn how to bring engineering designs into the physical world using a variety of engineering tools, skills, and practices, including cutting-edge CAD and CAM software. CNC machines, 3D printers, and laser cutters are just a few of the technologies that will be used to manufacture student engineer designs. Students will be introduced to basic electronics, microcontrollers, and computer programming while learning to design, build, and program robotic and automation devices. Environmental Science and Field Research Students take part in several field trips in order to experience the San Joaquin Valley, San Joaquin River, Pacific Coast, and Sierra Nevada Mountains. Students will carry out hands-on projects relating to careers in marine biology, wildlife rehabilitation, air quality, river ecology, alternative energy, and forests. Students will have the opportunity to work with environmental professionals and government agencies to complete scientific projects. Some examples are growing native plants, restoring native wildlife habitat, rehabilitating injured and orphaned wildlife species, monitoring forests, experimenting in wetlands, and conducting studies of tide pools and beaches. Forensic Research and Biotechnology Students use investigative science techniques to solve intriguing problems involving the law. Scientific evidence, DNA, fingerprinting, physical evidence, scene reconstruction, and biotechnology are used to create a picture of what happened in the past. Interactive Game Design Game design requires skill in a number of areas including graphic design, programming, audio, app development, animation, and modeling. All students have the opportunity to learn about each of these areas while working in teams to create original games and characters rendered in both two and three dimensions. Students are introduced to industry standard software such as 3D Studio Max, Unity 3D, XNA Game Studio, Unreal, Flash, and Photoshop. Law and Order and Policy. Students study the major aspects of constitutional, criminal, and civil law. Projects teach students about their individual rights and criminal procedure, how laws are made, and how to make a legal argument. Students learn to research and discuss current and historical controversial issues relating to the law. All students have the opportunity to participate in mock trials and field trips to local and federal courthouses and law firms. Digital Marketing and Entrepreneurship Students explore how companies develop their branding through product development, pricing strategies, promotional campaigns, and global product placement. Students enjoy hands-on learning as they develop their own product brands and promotional campaigns, including online advertising and social media, television, radio, mobile, and print advertising. Students learn industry standard technology for conducting market research and creating advertising products. Multimedia, digital media, and graphic design. Students develop skills in communication and message design, including color, typography, and design principles. 
They will investigate graphic and web techniques in cooperative teams similar to corporate settings. Design students will work on all stages of production using industry standard software to create original products such as logos, posters, newspapers, advertisements, websites, and two-dimensional animation. Multimedia, digital video production and broadcast. Students develop skills in television and film production. Using industry standard software packages, students will engage in hands-on integrated curriculum. They work on all stages of production while creating products such as short films, advertisements, journalism broadcasts, and documentaries. All multimedia students develop skills in the content and presentation of message design, the sociological impacts of media, and the stages of production cycle. Psychology and Human Behavior Students investigate the inner workings of the human mind using principles found in psychology and neuroscience. Through research, students consider the factors that influence, control, change, and modify behavior. Students explore the world of psychology through labs, multiple hands-on activities, and projects. Projects include working in teams to create illusions that investigate how the brain constructs a person's perception of reality. In addition, students build on existing research by designing and conducting experiments based off studies found in academic journals. Web Application Development Students go beyond being a user of technology and become certified to design, develop, and deploy rich internet applications, websites, and games using Web 2.0 developer tools such as Java, SQL, HTML5, CSS3, and JavaScript. They will learn the foundational skills of object-oriented programming, web design, database design, scripting, and graphical user interface design to ensure that end users have a positive experience and return again and again to the applications. Certifications through Microsoft, Adobe, and CIW are available.